Okie dokie. All right, so hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Nicole Cipriani from the University of Chicago and I'm gonna be doing um, two hours today, one on head and neck and one on bone and, so on bone. and then I believe tomorrow I'll give you guys your two hours uh, on soft tissue. So um, if you have any questions, uh, please do type uh, it, and I will try to answer them as we go or, or at the end. Um, all right, without further ado, um, we're gonna be talking in the head and neck about squamous lesions, some bony lesions, some nasal lesions, larynx, salivary, um, and a little bit on the ear. Um, so we'll start with the squamous lesions, um, uh, both the non-neoplastic and the neoplastic. So one of the most common you know, reasons that people come to clinical attention in, in the oral cavity and the mucosal surfaces um, is for leukoplakia, erythroplakia. Um, and so, as you know, you know, leuco white, erythro red, um, these are clinical appearances of oral mucosa um, that histologically may represent a variety of entities ranging anywhere from purely just hyperkeratosis to hyperplasia, infection, dysplasia, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about some of the findings um, that we may see on biopsy in leuco or erythroplakia. Um, so for the infectious diseases, there's oral hairy leukoplakia, which is uh, occurring in association with Epstein-Barr virus, um, uh, generally in immunocompromised people on the lateral border of tongue, again, sort of cannot be wiped off, um, and so therefore undergoes biopsy. And so the characteristic findings here are these sort of balloon cells um, uh, in the epithelium where the uh, cytoplasm around the nuclei becomes sort of um, White, uh, white or pale, um, and applying EBV or EBER-ish essentially will highlight those balloon cells in the epithelium. Um, so that's diagnostic of oral hairy leukoplakia. Um, similarly, candidiasis may also present um, as a plaque that cannot be wiped off. And this is when we see a biopsy of, of candidiasis. You know, generally, if it's just thrush that you can wipe off, um, uh, or the clinicians can wipe off, we don't really see biopsies of those. However, in hyperplastic candidiasis, where you have um, thickening of the sort of a reedy, uh, bulbous reedy, um, neutrophilic inflammation in the surface, and then associated uh, candida or fungal hyphae sort of piercing through the surface, this is what we see in so-called hyperplastic candidiasis. Um, in these cases, it can be challenging to evaluate for the presence of dysplasia. Um, so sometimes if it's uncertain whether there's superimposed dysplasia, we may recommend rebiopsy after resolution um, of, the, of the infection. Um, next is lichen planus, which is an autoimmune mucositis generally in, in, in young to middle-aged females. Um, it presents as these characteristic Wickham's striae, which are white streaks on red patches. So white on red, um, and on biopsy, we see these sawtooth or sort of downward pointing uh, reedy ridges with a very dense band-like uh, chronic inflammatory infiltrate in the stroma. And uh, if the clinician is alerted to this, they may send us a biopsy for immunofluorescence. And if they do, what we'll see is a, a sort of linear to granular deposition of fibrinogen um, at the basement membrane, which is, is um, diagnostic of lichen planus in association with the histologic picture. The other biopsies for which immunofluorescence is helpful are the other vesiculobullous diseases, um, those being pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid. So depending on where the antigen is, um, will dictate where the bulla happens, right? So if you have the, the antigen being the, the desmosomes between the epithelial cells, um, you, you have an intra-epithelial blister. So the, the cells themselves break apart um, and you have uh, the cells break apart from each other where you have potentially a retention of cells at the basement membrane layer and then a blister above it. And you'll see a fishnet-like pattern on IF um, of IgG, IgM, and C3. Conversely, in bolus pemphigoid, the antigen is in the basement membrane. So the entire epithelium will uh, blister off and you have a disconnect between the epithelium and the stroma. And here you see a deposition uh, of antigen um, at the basement membrane level. So that's how to distinguish uh, these, these, these diseases. Um, uh, I, when possible, I've tried to provide for you some comparison charts that I'm not necessarily gonna go through um, because we've already seen these entities, 
but these are here for your, um, your use, your comparative um, uh, analogies between the cases. Okay. Um, moving into the the stromal lesions, so these are these are lesions that don't necessarily involve uh, the epithelium, but really involve the stroma below the epithelium. And I put epulous and granular cell tumor here together, um, even though they are very clinically distinct. They occur either in a young newborn population versus more of an uh, you know adult population, but the histology is very very similar. Um, so they both have these granular cells that occupy the stroma. Um, uh, epuli are see these exophytic masses on the alveolar ridges of newborns. Granular cell tumors are more sort of uh, sessile or deeper seated masses. Um, and the granular cells in epuli are, are different in a few ways. One, they have very distinct cell borders. And two, they generally lack the presence of S100 in contrast to true granular cell tumor. And they do not generally have uh, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia overlying them. Conversely, granular cell tumors are thought to be potentially modified Schwann cells, so they are positive for S100 and SOX10. Um, their borders are relatively more indistinct, and they generally do have pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia on the top, as you can see here. Pseudoepitheliomatous basically means pseudocarcinomatous, so these squamous proliferations may appear as carcinoma, um, but really on top of a granular cell tumor should really not be considered malignant. Um, so if you ever see anything on biopsy that looks like a potential granular cell tumor in the stroma, be very cautious um, and really refrain from a diagnosis of carcinoma. So here's clinically what they might look like as you can see more pedunculated versus sessile. Old term for squamous cell carcinoma was epithelioma. Exactly, exactly. Thank God we don't use that anymore. I think that's <laughs> a very, uh, very challenging word. Um, all right, lobular capillary hemangioma or pyogenic granuloma. Um, this is a benign uh, either tumor or a reactive proliferation of vessels um, that grows in lobules, as you can see here underneath the surface epithelium. The surface may or may not be uh, uh, ulcerated. In this case, um, it is not, but the capillaries below it on low power present in these, these lobules. Um, you may see slit-like kind of feeder vessels, um, and on higher power, you can definitely see that the lesional cells are made of, are made of uh, vascular spaces. Now, you know, pyogenic granulomas or lobular capillary hemangiomas are, um, you know, active proliferative lesions. And so the presence of mitotic figures in these cases is okay, um, as long as they are not atypical mitoses and as long as they retain um, the uh, sort of lobular architecture, you will be fine for a, for a benign diagnosis here. You can see these not only in the mucosal sites, but also in the, um, you know, uh, uh, skin sites as well. Okay, moving on to squamous dysplasias and squamous carcinomas. So, you know, when we were we in this presentation, we're going to think about squamous carcinomas in two ways. One are the sort of classic keratinizing carcinomas that are related to the general environmental carcinogens of tobacco, alcohol, even beetle nut chewing, um, versus the non-keratinizing carcinomas, which are going to come next, which are related to virus. Um, when you're looking at a keratinizing dysplasia or a keratinizing carcinoma, um, in grading of the dysplasia, you essentially want to eliminate the superficial hyper or parakeratotic layer when grading dysplasia. Although, as we know, this, is, this has a lot of inter-observer variability and the grade of dysplasia does not always correlate to the presence of invasive carcinoma. And so you can have low grade dysplasia with development of carcinoma. It doesn't have to progress through the nice, low, intermediate, high. Um, so just keep that in mind, even though we do try to grade it uh, in a three-part three fashion in the, in the oral cavity, mild, moderate, severe. Um, prognosis in the oral cavity relates both to tumor size, tumor depth of invasion, and status of lymph nodes. So one of the important concepts in, in oral cavity cancers is measuring depth of invasion. And I just wanted to point out here how to do that for your clinical practice. And so you're essentially, one, DOI is important for... Um, both for tumor stage, as well as for the for predicting uh, the possible presence of regional lymph node metastases. So depth of invasion three millimeters or more uh, in the tongue is predictive of potential um, increased risk for lymph node mets. And so these patients